Tran. I have been living with metastatic breast cancer since 2009. I'd like to welcome you to our session, Finding Support Online, NBC Groups, and Social Media. Our speaker today is Catherine O'Brien. <laughs> Catherine O'Brien is Secretary of the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network. She was diagnosed with a small volume of bone mets in 2009 at the age of 43. She continues to work full-time uh, writing and editing technical art articles for Business to Business magazine. Building on her writing expertise, she has been a key person in the development of MBCN's media and print initiatives. She's also a very humble, um, loyal, <laughs> helps old ladies across the street. Uh, I, I have a blog, it's called uh, I Hate Breast Cancer, and I uh, frequently contribute also. Uh, NBC has a blog. I was called NBC Buzz. Um, uh, let's give a fine, warm NBCN welcome to our speaker. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, so, okay, so on, in terms of social media, so I told you a little bit about my start, how uh, I got initiated into the world of uh, metastatic breast cancer. And because of the doctors here, I have to tell you a disclosure of my own. And my disclosure is, um, somebody asked me this this morning, they thought I was a, a college classmate. Uh, I went to the University of Illinois uh, in Champaign-Urbana, and I, majored in, I was an English major. And uh, for those of you who don't know this, <laughs> you know, some people may have wondered, you know, what's the difference between an English major and a large pepperoni pizza? <laughs> and the difference is the pepperoni pizza can feed a family of four. Uh, so I must say <laughs> that works well if you have a kid who is going to school in any sort of uh, humanities. You can feel free to adapt that joke as, as you would like. Uh, and uh, the reason I say that is because I, I, this does actually tie into the end of my talk. And um, the reason that I say that is because um, uh, that's one reason that I, uh, I, in some respects, I was sort of thrown into social media. But continuing on. So as I said, I was diagnosed with a small volume of bone mets in 2009. I was a de novo presentation. Uh, this is my first breast cancer rodeo. And because of my family history of breast cancer, my mom had died from breast cancer when I was a senior in high school. And that was my, that's what I thought when you had metastatic breast cancer. I, everything was colored through my experience of 25, 30 years ago. So uh, I was not in a good place when I was first diagnosed. And so, of course, my first step was consult Dr. Google. <laughs> um, and uh, so I went on Dr. Google, and the first site that I found that really resonated with me was, oh, I'm sorry, I was still... <laughs> still panicking, uh, was breastcancer.org. And what I liked about the site was the articles were easy to understand. Uh, they were comprehensive. And they also, um, I believe most of them are medically reviewed. Usually there was uh, something at, uh, on some of the articles that indicated you know, the date, so you knew it was, it was timely. And you know, I found that the information, to my knowledge, uh, was current. I wanted to also point out, um, at that time, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network was, uh, had a limited uh, web presence, and we really have a much bigger web presence. So um, were I diagnosed today, I would certainly, of course, uh, go to nbcn.org, breastcancer.org, though, uh, a real beacon when I needed it. And one thing, and I would even encourage you, even if you have been diagnosed for a while, this is a great publication. Uh, it's, for, it's on breastcancer.org. If you just Google breastcancer.org and Guide to Breast Cancer Pathology Report, really helped. I wished that I had had this sooner, but it was very, very helpful. Um, and I would still share that today. But um, early on, so I found breastcancer.org, and I just looked at symptoms and diagnosis, just the basic information and, and that type of thing. And, you know, I thought it was great. And I never, I looked at it, and, you know, I never really thought of, like, looking further on the site. But then I saw the next tab, which was all the way to the right. They said discussion boards and blog. 
I don't know what made me click there. I, I just did one day, and then I found, it was like Alice through the looking glass. I found all these people that were talking to each other, and I wasn't alone. And um, I had no idea there was something like that out there. Uh, and it really, you know, it's, when you are diagnosed with breast cancer, probably any breast cancer, but I was fortunate in my community in Illinois, we actually have a support group for um, people with a metastatic or people with metastatic breast cancer. A lot of people don't have that, but you know, when you have a question about metastatic breast cancer, it's keeping you up at night. You can't wait for the support group that meets once a week or every other week. So what was really good was you could just go on there and you know, somebody is generally there, you know, because we have people from all over the world, really. And um, so breastcancer.org has um, very many subdivisions. You can, they have, uh, uh, by stage of breast cancer, I generally have stayed within the stage four board. Uh, but really, if you were having a procedure, they have one for people who are having surgery at a certain time. If you are on chemotherapy, they have, um, especially for early stage people, they have, you know, starting chemo on. For those who are ongoing on chemotherapy, of course, on stage four, there's usually a subthread within the stage four board. Um, so I kind of hesitated at first. I was not somebody that, you know, I guess I have a somewhat uh, old-fashioned Midwestern approach of really don't, you know, you don't uh, go online and start spreading your business around. I mean, that's, you know. Uh, that's just not something that you would do. So I took me, I kind of lurked for a while and eventually I started commenting. Um, and, um, you know, it, did, it was a very, like I said, it was really a, a port in a storm. Um, some things to know about breastcancer.org. It's a moderated board, um, so you can't, um, you can't be selling things on the board. You can't be having a fundraiser for yourself on the board. You know, there's a certain uh, civility so forth is expected there. Uh, the stage four board is only for those who are living with metastatic disease. They have a separate caregiver forum thread. Uh, and um, again, there's other different stages, but they do ask that only those who are living with stage four metastatic disease uh, be participating in there. People do not usually use their real names. Um, usually they, Whatever it was that you made up in the, you know, uh, terrible moment that you were at, like, I can't believe this is happening to me. Uh, it was, I can't remember if she's still on there. One of my favorites was um, one woman's husband, a common expression to her was, uh, hey, you look like you need a beer. And that was, <laughs> that was her screen name. The one thing to know about breastcancer.org, which I think sometimes people don't think of, is if you Google uh, your the screen name and the particular topic, it will show up there. So if you have a sensitive topic that you're talking about or, you know, oftentimes people will use these boards to vent. You know, people don't understand, my family doesn't un understand. And I always do wonder, sometimes if you have a very specific situation, an unusual presentation, or you've, you know, uh, left uh, certain clues about your family, I would be, my own self, I, you know, I think that I would be very, I might have said something in a very light mode and, you know, not realizing that my family would find this. That's the only thing that I would be, I would just be a little bit leery of um, saying something that, you know, somebody might see out of context. Similar discussion boards. Um, there's inspire.com, which has many different um, sort of sub-threads of, um, you know, if it, I don't, I hope that no one from inspire.com will correct me, but I kind of think like if you have a disease, inspire.com <laughs> has got a, a message board for you. Uh, there's bcmets.org, and I know that we have some people here who are on that board. And we have uh, her2.org uh, and uh, Triple Negative Foundation also has a discussion forum for people that have um, triple negative breast cancer. I, those last two I would specifically mention because I know that those subtypes can impose their own challenges. And so if you had a question about that, I would, I would definitely check those out. Uh, about Inspire.com is moderated. Um, it, as I said, it's not just breast cancer. It's many other different diseases. 
um, inspire this I will just quote how they describe themselves uh, inspire builds online health and wellness communities for patients and caregivers in partnership with national patient advocacy organizations and helps life science organizations connect with these highly engaged populations so I don't know but that suggests to me that your information may be being shared and again I would just be very clear on uh, what information you're giving and how it might be used. Uh, Inspire.com, again, people generally do not use their real names. It is moderated. It is online searchable. If you are complaining about someone in your life, my suggestion would be not to do it on Inspire.com. Uh, you, you can get email notifications if you have posed a question in the thread and someone has come on and answered you, very similar to your Facebook type notification. Uh, bcmets.org, um, this was founded by Pete Bevan, uh, Pete's wife had inflammatory breast cancer and um, this is 14 years ago and this, this is still going strong uh, and on it, bcmets.org I would say is kind of moderated, um, you know it's, I think it's sort of maybe self-policing might be how I would say it. It's internet searchable. Um, I said Musa is there. Um, advocate Musa Mayer is on that on that thread often, and oftentimes that will be a question. She's very knowledgeable, and sometimes I mean, she, if she didn't know, she would say that she didn't know. But she would people would say Musa, I have this question, and she's very expert on uh, many facets of metastatic breast cancer. So it's very nice to sort of have. Um, I would call it a sort of ask the expert and unofficial ask the expert component to that. Same thing, email notifications there. Subset boards, I mentioned, uh, there's her2support.org. This was a new one. I had not heard of this one. Um, uh, I think it's Chris Carr has the My Crazy Sexy Life. Well, we are, we are represented, ladies. <laughs> we have the metastatic breast cancer babes. And they do, they have a, um, I just joined that one and they have a you know, somewhat active um, uh, forum there, but I think that's one good function of coming to this meeting is, you know, I'd like to think that I'm pretty up on these things. I'm like, I didn't know there was one, so another one to check out. Uh, before we leave discussion boards, again, I would say, I would look at what is the privacy situation? Um, is your email out and, you know, out in public? Is it, is it freely uh, searchable on Google? What information are you sharing? And then, um, you know, I will just use the breastcancer.org uh, site as, uh, as an example. Because that site is only open to people with stage four breast cancer, I think people have a false sense of complacency or privacy because they forget, even though others cannot respond, there's nothing stopping them from reading on there. And then as people get sort of more comfortable, as you do with, you know, people that you sort of talk to online, you know, people are sharing pictures and so forth, which that's a decision that, um, you know, anything that you're doing on social media, whether it's something like this, Facebook, whatever, that is something to think about. But I do think, you know, just because you can't see who's reading there, there's a lot of people that I'm sure read that board and you should know um, what they will, you know, what information you're putting out there. Uh, oops, well, that is one. Um, there is one thing that happens with uh, every, every board that I have seen, eventually this happens, the cat fight. Um, and, you know, I think it, what I have seen is that boards kind of, um, they will sort of go in peaks and valleys. And some of that is, it's just like anything, there's different personalities that will be on a board. Uh, and eventually somebody will get sideways with somebody else. Um, and I don't really, you know, I think moderation can help, but eventually you know it's going to happen. And what I have seen happen from that is people will decamp from one of these sites and they'll start their own group. This is, I think, a sort of relatively new phenomenon, but we now have um, these new groups, which are closed Facebook groups. And I think, you know, you sort of have to be on Facebook to take advantage of this. Uh, but this is a Facebook group with a closed discussion. And what this means is, um, depending, you know, no one could see the, the, um, the conversations of that group that is not on your public feed. You might have to look, if it was important to you that, pe that people not see that you were a member of the group, probably would have to check your settings closely. But it is, it does provide a little bit more privacy because 
the, the discussion is essentially going on behind, let's say, a closed door. I mean, you cannot, you, you don't see that on somebody's public feed. Um, you have to be approved into the group, and um, that makes it sound like it's like some kind of initiation. It's not really like that. It's, they do uh, sort of, they want to make sure that somebody uh, is who they say they are and does have what they say. But it's pretty, you know, usually it's somebody will know somebody and say, oh, this is my friend. I can vouch for her type thing. Still happens, um, even though it's a cl closed Facebook group and they do, most of them sort of have a policy on what you can do. There are still, um, people will get into uh, heated discussions, uh, same thing that anyone gets into fights about politics, religion. Uh, people often do get uh, a little bit uh, heated about um, alternate treatment, but um, a lot of people are in several groups. I think I'm in about three or four. Uh, it, my participation I know varies in terms of um, some, you know, it started out as completely, informa completely information seeking and, you know, now it's a little bit more social. Um, the one thing I would say, I think if you are on any of these boards for any length of time, some of your friends are going to die. And it's very awkward because often there's no closure. Um, in some cases I've had friends that died and I, mean, I knew the person from online. I wasn't sure of the person's real name. And, you know, it wouldn't be, I never met the person in real life. I wouldn't even know if I would feel comfortable sending a condolence card because then you have to explain, you know, I'm, you know, Nutty Nancy from the Facebook group. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, again, I would also, as with any internet um, activity, I would make sure that you know what you're putting out there, who can see it, and um, uh, what your understanding of your privacy is versus what really exists. Pinterest, I think people would be surprised. Um, you know, most people know of it, of, oh, that's where you have recipes or um, oh, I'm, you know, doing some uh, interior decorating or kind of my wish list for that. And it's a, not a place that you would necessarily think to go to for metastatic breast cancer information. And to be honest, there is not a lot of info there. But what I like about it is it's kind of a handy way, like when I see that somebody has a metastatic breast cancer blog or there's a story in the newspaper about someone dealing with metastatic disease, um, I add it to uh, NBCN's Pinterest board. And we have about 100 stories of people living with metastatic breast cancer. So I think it's, you know, I, to me it is uh, just sort of a handy, almost note-taking thing. Uh, and we will have, be adding some more things there. So um, I don't know, on a personal level, I don't know if it would be something that everyone would want to use, but you should know that MBCN is on Pinterest and we have some info that you might find helpful. Um, go back one. Yep. So the one thing that I would say about social media is that it should be more inclusive. Um, you know, the one thing, just in terms of metastatic breast cancer in general, um, you know, more Caucasian women will get breast cancer, but unfortunately, uh, more African American women will die from it. And this, as a communicator and someone living with metastatic breast cancer and an advocate, this really bothers me because we know that the uh, African American population is very active on Twitter. As we, as we can tell from this uh, Pew Research study, more than one quarter of onli online African Americans, 28%, use Twitter with 13% doing so on a typical day. And yet, you know, I know of just a very small handful of African American women who are uh, blogging or tweeting or what have you. And I think that it isn't, it isn't that they're not necessarily there. I think that, you know, I think that we might not be looking at outlets that would, that, um, you know, I think that we may have we might be having very separate conversations. And I, I think that the one thing that I will say that is good about um, the Facebook groups is it's very diverse. And you know, I've met people that I would never have otherwise met. Uh, but I do think um, that we can, you know, I do. One thing that bothered me was earlier this year, um, 
there was a big to do because um, the uh, New York Times uh, ran an editorial in which there is a, a woman uh, in New York and she's uh, basically she's very active on Twitter. She has metastatic breast cancer and her name is Lisa Adams. And um, Lisa was unfairly um, sort of attacked by uh, Bill Keller and his uh, in the New York Times. And what really bothered me was there was a lot of coverage on you know this, and it was true. I mean, it was, certainly was merited. She was, uh, to make a long story short, um, she was sort of unfairly characterized um, in many respects as, you know, as sort of having an unrealistic view of her illness. Let's just put it that way. And um, it, that wasn't right, but it bothered me that in December, same newspaper had a very long article on racial disparities in breast cancer, not a peep. You know, so this is what was chosen to be as important was, you know, a woman who is from, you know, one of the wealthiest suburbs of Connecticut, you know, and she's tweeting. Well, you know, interesting, but what about those people that we're not hearing from? You know, I think that, I just think that it's just something that, um, that uh, I think that those are voices that aren't being heard and I think that they should be. So that's, that is my soapbox on that. Uh, some thoughts on Twitter. I think it's a great networking tool. Um, I've met a lot of people on Twitter that I would never have met otherwise. Um, I've learned about a lot of great articles and resources, um, especially like when news is coming out, oftentimes um, you can, you know, you'll see it there first. And, you know, but I would caution, there's a lot of noise. I, I, always, like, I always find it interesting to see who follows me on Twitter. Some people, and I, that has introduced me to a lot of people with metastatic breast cancer that I wouldn't otherwise know, so I'm always grateful for that. But for every person that I think, oh, that's interesting, I'll follow that person back, there's somebody that's selling something or someone that you have no idea why they followed you and you just think it must be like a robo thing of like they're picking up robo followers. And I, I would say that's one thing in terms of um, in my professional life, I had to sort through a lot of press releases and I really think that helps me on Twitter because it's very quick. It's like, no, 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 you know, that's, that's no good, throw that out. Uh, if you don't want to stay on Twitter, you can still search Twitter for a keyword or hashtag and I will give an example of this. Um, uh, the other week I was just curious, so I searched metastatic and the news item, I think I just said metastatic or metastatic breast cancer. And the news item that came up uh, was about an orangutan uh, in the Utah Zoo that died from metastatic breast cancer. Uh, I, was, I was so mad, you know, because uh, no, no offense to the, or, you know, no offense to the animal lovers, um, you know, but what bothered me is one orangutan dies and it gets an article <laughs> and, you know, that was one orangutan on one day. 108 people die from metastatic breast cancer every day in the United States, 40,000 a year, and we're talking about the orangutan. So um, I think that that illustrates two things. Um, well, three. <laughs> News is not what it used to be, but uh, the other thing would be um, Twitter as a social platform or as uh, you know as an activist platform uh, because I did I did you know I did I did have this I did have to say something about that and uh, you know a few a few people retweeted it and passed it on uh, and uh, but also just in general it's also if you just do a quick search like that you can you know you can find something that you didn't even know was out there uh, Twitter chats I think are tricky um, because it can be just a volley of uh, responses going back and forth. And sometimes, to be honest, with, if it's not a subject that is of particular interest to me, I will just follow the hashtag later and then just sort of, you can read a summary of it. Um, the, the other thing I should say on that is, now that having said that, with that big buildup, uh, NBCN is actually doing a Twitter chat on uh, October 13th, so stay tuned, more details to follow. Uh, I do think that it's just, as in the, the printing business, um, it's very unusual that one outlet would be right for everything. So I think, you know, you have need for Facebook, it has a place, Twitter, uh, Pinterest, as I said, good old fashioned face-to-face -face networking. So I think each has its um, advantages and disadvantages. 
And it's, a, it's also very much personal preference how you like to get your information. Uh, I do think there is a good way to use social media for education. It's a creative way to make a point. There's uh, viral potential and potential for quick action. So if you see this, this is the metastatic breast cancer uh, bingo card. And uh, what this is, <laughs> is, um, right, so we've all seen on Facebook the silly games of, you know, you make a silly remark. And I thought, well, why can't we have our own response, you know? And so, um, you know, what you can do is basically play along at home and like every time, and some people looked at it and said, I have bingo right away, you know, because they, they've heard all of these things. Like, so um, I think it can be an effective way to pass along a message. Uh, some people will say, well, I don't like Facebook, or I've never done that, or, you know, that's just, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Twitter. I wanted to mention Phil McCartan, and Phil, um, if you have uh, HER2 positive disease, you might know him. Uh, his wife, Lorraine, has, uh, is HER2 positive, and she was one of the uh, early recipients of TDM1, aka Super Herceptin, and she had an access issue to it. To tell a short version of this, uh, a clinical trial was supposed to open, and it didn't, and so to get the drug, she had to, um, she lives in Boston, and I think she had to fly to, might have been North Carolina, but it was very, it was very inconvenient to do this. She was doing very well on the drug. And so Phil decided to take action, and he wanted to, you know, move things along. And I first encountered Phil, he was on Inspire. And I just remember thinking, you know, he, I remember he went to send me an email, and I just remember thinking, wow, this guy, and he didn't, he wanted to, like, include an attachment or something, and he, he didn't include the attachment. And I thought, he's never going to, you know, he can't even send me an email. He's He's never going to get anywhere, but he did. Uh, he started his Facebook page. It's called Our Her Two Struggle, and um, maybe he should change the name because I don't know. I think certainly it remains a challenge, but the specific struggle is no longer there because his wife was able to uh, enroll. And she's able to get the drug in her uh, in Boston, you know, where she lives. She no longer has to make this arduous journey, and. Um, you know, the only thing about that was Phil didn't just, uh, what I admire about Phil also is that he just didn't stop uh, when his problem was solved. He kind of continues that page and he, he will also, um, I know he's uh, conducted, he's helped organize some rallies to kind of call the, att the attention of the, of the need for like more drugs and um, I'm freely extrapolating. I'll say faster FDA approval. I think that would be accurate. Um, and like I said, this was somebody that, as I said, you know, was struggling and on Inspire and as I, you know, I, I was, I thought, wow, you know, this, this email, the, the email seems to be a little bit behind him, but, you know, more power to him because he did it, he, pers he persevered, and he used social media to his advantage. Uh, the other thing I would say, finally, is that if I can do it, you can. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was the, that's the outtake of my uh, headshot for work. Um, but uh, initially I was very skeptical of social media because you know, I should also explain as an editor, um, this was one more thing I was going to have to do. This was something that was going to be sort of added to me and I didn't want to do it. You know, it was, I didn't, you know, why would I want to do this? It was just one more thing. But then my professional life kind of forced my personal hand and what was happening was um, times were pretty tough in the printing industry, and it looked like my job was going to be winding down. Now, yeah, I had been in the same job for about 15 years, and, you know, it, I, you know I could type, you know, that was, that was what, it, when I came in, that's what you needed to know, you know. And I also, I learned how to type, on, you know, on a typewriter, so certainly I should, I certainly, I used a computer, but I had very basic you know, uh, computer skills, and I knew that in a changing job environment, I would, I would be expected, as an editor, I would be expected to be fluent in social media. And um, I thought, well, I just have to sort of jump in, and I did. And I think that, you know, probably I could do some things better, but I did find, like, okay, this isn't, you know, I can do this, this isn't too bad. But, I mean, I was kind of like, 
pushed into it, um, and then I, I got interested in it. Um, I do think that uh, there is value in a multimedia approach. I don't think one of these outlets is necessarily better. I think it's a personal preference. Uh, I think it also depends on the type of thing that you're looking for. Uh, I also think, like, I mentioned my mom, and my mom, this, my mom died in 1983, and she had inflammatory breast cancer. And I think, uh, I'm pretty sure, I mean, we lived in a small town, and I'm pretty sure that my mom never met anybody with metastatic breast cancer, let alone, um, you know, she, I'm, I'm sure she never met anyone with inflammatory breast cancer. And I often think, like, you know, what a different world we're living in now. Um, because my mom also was, you know, a somewhat shy person, and I don't know, she might not have commented on it, but I know she was, she was very inquisitive. I know she would have read it, you know. I know she would have been out there, but she didn't have that opportunity, and I think we have more information at our fingertips today than ever, and I think that, you know, we, we would do well to use it. Uh, so that was, uh, I did tell you that I was going to tie in uh, what um, being an English major had to do with it. And that was it, um, you know, because uh, as I said, um, it wasn't like I was going to be able to find another job. Uh, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. I was an English major. And uh, so I kind of, this was something that I sort of had to need, that I needed to know how to do. But also the one other thing that I would say, what I would end with um, is uh, in the printing industry, um, I mean, we saw the power of the printing press um, when Johann Gutenberg, I just have to correct one fallacy, Johann Gutenberg did not invent the printing press. He invented movable type. We can credit the Chinese with inventing the printing press pretty much. Anyhow, back to my point. Um, and uh, when you see, when you look at what the printing press did, um, it put learning in the hands of everyday people. Um, before that, only, only the very, you know, essentially if you were in the church, you had access to this. But when we saw this, I mean, this really set things in motion. You saw, you know, the Protestant Reformation, uh, basically learning, basically just, you know, just rocketed. And you can see this also um, on the political side of things. Um, I would mention, uh, we've seen this, um, you know, I think Arab Spring might be an example of this. The one challenge I would say is that that got things started. I think it's hard to maintain a movement <laughs> on Twitter. But I would say, I mean, we have, it used to be pretty much all of the things that I mentioned, it used to be, um, you know, way back when, only if you worked as a scientist, if you, you were a U.S. scientist, you had access to ARPA. And we have so much at our fingertips, and I think it would be, I, you know, I have to say it, I think you owe it to yourself to check it out. So. That is it. Any, does anyone have any questions? If there is no, oh. I don't know, you know, I'm just going to ask you one question. Okay. What I observe here is that, you know, that I've been here in the uh, I've been in North Carolina, and I, I know that North Carolina lost some of the conservation energy around, you know, the mm -hmm. I think it's, I think we were both in the, the session yesterday, and I think there's, um, you know, even two of our speakers yesterday who are here from North Carolina, who are here from North Carolina, they talked about starting a support group, and oftentimes they, the two founders, would really be the only people there. So I think there are, um, as they alluded to yesterday, there are some, uh, to a degree, there are some cultural issues of, in, this in that particular community, as I said, don't talk about cancer. Well, I made notes of what they did say that I thought we could act on, which was uh, the woman said, if you were having a breast cancer, if you said breast cancer fair or breast cancer event, no one would come. If you said breast health, you know, health rather than cancer, I'm like, okay, I can, you know, I can, you know, I can see that that's uh, different. Um, I would not have thought of that. So certainly things like that. 
The one thing I would say is um, we are one meeting. There are other meetings. Uh, for example, in two weeks' time, I'm going to Living Beyond Breast Cancer, which is based in Philadelphia. And although I haven't asked them about the turnout of their meeting, just from you know general observation, they do get a pretty good African American and you know a pretty diverse uh, turnout there. But in general, I do think that. You know, I have thought of this, um, it must be very difficult to essentially be, um, we as people with metastatic breast cancer, some would feel a minority within the breast cancer community at large. And I can't imagine, uh, one of our speakers yesterday uh, shared that um, she had had a mastectomy and a Reach for Recovery volunteer brought her um, a temporary um, prosthetic uh, made out of uh, lamb's wool. Uh, but the, the, it, was, it was white. And she said, my, my skin isn't, this doesn't match. And, and you know, that was kind of, essentially what I understood from this particular situation was that's what they had. And I think that's terrible. Um, I think we, you know, I think everyone deserves to be, uh, you know, acknowledge that we're not, that we have different concerns. Um, and we do, um, you know, so, uh, I think there's, uh, we definitely, at uh, NBCM, we're very sensitive uh, to that. And we do, you know, we definitely, um, we definitely um, have made that effort. I think there's a lot more to do. And I think uh, to tie it also back in, if you remember when Shirley first started talking, she alluded to the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network. As part of that group, uh, we, NBCN, were there with uh, the Sisters Network, uh, Nueva Vida, um, and so that is, um, you know, I can't say that's one tangible thing that we're doing. Oh, thank you very much.